when you eat grain to the level of heart disease development, to the level of cancer development, you now gravitate toward treating those problems. Both of these problems, you know, vast majority of them are caused by lifestyle issues. And now we're going to treat it with an artificial chemical. So this is artificial manipulation. Of your chemistry and what this does is it doesn't really treat the disease itself it treats what doctors call risk factors if you have for example with heart disease if you have high blood pressure they give you a drug to lower your blood pressure but they don't ask why your blood pressure is high most people develop high blood pressure because they have low oxygen and they have low oxygen because they're malnourished and because their red blood cells are struggling to perform and struggling to do their job, so they can't deliver adequate oxygen, so blood pressure naturally goes up because the body is saying the brain is not getting enough oxygen. Increase the pressure to get more oxygen to the brain. So what doctors do instead is they diagnose you with high blood pressure. They control artificially the risk factor of high blood pressure, and in so doing, create other risk factors. So new risk factors are then created. For example, if you're taking a blood pressure medication, one of the side effects of the vast majority of blood pressure medications is it reduces vitamin B1, and it also reduces something called coenzyme Q10. Well, vitamin B1 deficiency causes beriberi, which is a form of congestive heart failure. CoQ10 deficiency causes high blood pressure and congestive heart failure. So again, you're medicating the problem, creating new risk factors that are nutritional in relationship, and doctors are happy to do it, not, and not necessarily that they're happy to hurt you, because I don't think any doctor is intentionally trying to hurt you, but they're happy to do it because they believe in their heart of hearts that controlling risk factors through chemical manipulation is an answer, and the reason they believe that is because there's virtually no nutritional training, and when you don't understand this stuff, how can you be held accountable to the patients that you're treating? And the answer is you really can't be, but that's why it's up to you. It's, not, it's, it's up to you as the consumer, as the intelligent, smart consumer who cares about yourself enough to ask questions, right? To pick and choose your doctor with scrutiny and with discernment and not just to give over all of your control and all of your power, right? to somebody who's going to hand you an artificial solution to modify your risk factors that end up creating new risk factors that end up contributing to more of the same disease that you're being treated for. And this is the pattern that we see repetitively. And this, again, one of the reasons why we see this repetitive pattern is because for most Americans, actually for most people in, in industrialized countries, this right here, grain, represents 60 to 80 percent of the total caloric intake of your total calories in a day, right? When you're eating, you know, some type of muffin or some type of wrap or some type of cereal or donut or kolache or pastry for breakfast, and you couple that with pizza or a sandwich or a hamburger or a hot dog or something along those lines for your lunch, and then at dinner again, it's more of the same. Again, the vast majority of the calories coming from grain-based calories, and grain comes with all of these things, and all of these things are known to contribute to cancer, and cancer, again, is the second most common cause of death in the United States. So going back to what I said earlier, which is all cancers, if we look at life, it's lifestyle, half of all cancers, and some speculate even more, I gave you very conservative statistics tonight, are modifiable by diet change and by lifestyle change. Well, this is the ultimate in diet change. This is why, uh, again, why we're having this conversation tonight. So that being said, I do want to talk a little bit more in depth about this component here, this nutritional deficiency component, because one of the things that we know, particularly if you are gluten sensitive, so if you have a gluten sensitivity issue, One of the problems that comes with that is malabsorption. And mal when I say malabsorption, we're talking about nutrients. Well, do nutrients play a role in cancer? They sure do. Um, vitamin D, iron, B vitamins. For example, we know folate deficiency is a contributing factor to human papillomavirus, which 
uh, is also a contributing factor to what many young ladies now are getting a vaccine for. If you've heard of the Gardasil vaccine uh, for, for, again, HPV, why are, they, why are they recommending, why are doctors recommending the vaccine? Because that virus contributes to cancer, but it's B vitamins, okay, that are known to help your body defend itself and to keep itself healthy from those viral replications, creating what's called dysplastic tissue in the cervix, which predominantly in females uh, is where this occurs. So cervical cancer is linked to that. So we know B vitamins contribute to cancer, and an, or I should say B vitamin deficiencies contribute to cancer, but then we also know that other nutrients like magnesium and calcium and zinc, we know they all contribute to cancer. Now, because of the time constraints that we have, again, I'm going to show you, uh, let's see, let's pull it up for you. Um, I'm going to show you because I want you to be able to go back and read this in depth. Uh, we don't have time to cover everything in it tonight, but I've put it together for you because I wanted you to have this as a resource because I know, again, many of you are going to battle this. 40% of you in your life time, you're going to develop a potential issue or diagnosis of cancer, and you want to be armed now. Get armed now and be able to take action now so that you can prevent um prevent the issue. So going back to the gluten causes nutritional deficiencies. Okay. And so what I've done here is I've kind of highlighted some of the big ones where we know the big players that really play a major role in the development of cancer. Zinc, for example, we know zinc is an antioxidant. We know it stabilizes your DNA. We know that stabilized DNA is less, has less of a tendency to develop into cancer cells. We know that studies have shown that zinc stops the growth of tumor cells. We know that iron is associated with cancers of the stomach. Uh, what did we say earlier about gluten also associated with cancers of the stomach? We know that vitamin B6 deficiency plays a major role in an increased risk of cancer. Human studies shown that higher vitamin B6 levels are associated with a 30 to 50% reduction in the risk of developing colon cancer. We know that vitamin D, I said earlier, vitamin D plays a role in 19 different forms of cancer. We know that vitamin D deficiency, uh, just solving that one problem in the U.S. alone uh, it's estimated would would um, would battle a number of cancers far better than chemo and radiation therapy over the long haul. In essence, uh, people that didn't become vitamin D deficient over time would have a less of a tendency to develop cancer. We know that selenium deficiency, uh, there's evidence that shows that selenium deficiency can cause cancers that we know that... Um, uh, so we'll stop there. So again, vitamin and mineral deficiencies play a big role because again, these vitamins and minerals or how your body fight cancer cells. Uh, we know that calorically, the carbohydrate content of grains and the way that people consume them is far too great uh, for the body, and so it can contribute to increased risk of cancer. We know that the processed food additives like meat glue and MSG and food dyes and food preservatives and other chemicals, we know those can increase the risk. Many of them can increase the risk for developing cancers. We know that pesticides can increase that risk. We know that toxic metals can increase that risk. We know that molds and mycotoxins and increased infections can all increase the risk of the development of cancer. And we know that not just gluten, but gluten and grains are packaged all together, as it, in my opinion, as one of the world's perfect poisons. Why? Because cancer doesn't happen. You don't walk, wake up one day with cancer. It's a slow, progressive, insidious disease that builds slowly with time. And so if, if you're aware of that, you can take action to mitigate your risk, reduce your risk, and potentially offset a major catastrophe in your life. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.